Hello, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us. My name is Edmund Clark. I am a tutor on the MA in Photojournalism and Documentary Photography at LCC, uh, the, that course at LCC. Um, and this evening we are having a discussion, um, um, one of the uh, discussions in the programme of events around the MA PJD Graduate Showcase, uh, which is online. Um, you can see that up online now if you just uh, search for LCC um, Graduate Showcase, you will see all the postgraduate postgraduate showcase, you'll see all the, uh, the work by the amazing postgraduates at LCC and MA PJD is in there. Uh, and there are a series of talks happening over the next week or so. They started last week. Uh, and tonight we will be talking about ideas of communities and COVID. And um, we are very lucky to have with us two speakers, uh, Stephen Ferner, who is a student, um, a graduate on the MA PJD course and uh, a local newspaper photographer. Um, and Lucia Robinson, who is the editor of the Tottenham Community Press. Uh, and I will come to them both shortly. Um, but I just wanted to kind of reflect a little bit on the idea of community in this very strange time. Um, when I was just kind of thinking in a personal way about kind of what community has meant to me and means to me at this very um, separated, distanced and for me, for a while anyway, there's some isolated life and the kind of ideas of some of the phraseology, some of the language which I've been kind of hearing about ideas of community transmission, and the very kind of concept of social distancing, um, kind of has, has brought home to me kind of concepts of community which are quite abstract in terms of kind of what we, we don't have anymore, or kind of calling into question how I feel about the people I pass in the street or in the supermarket, or the people that I haven't seen for months and months and months, and people I haven't been able to reach out to and touch. These kind of notions of what's close to us, what constitutes community, the bubbles that we live in, are kind of perhaps brought home to us even more than usual through uh, their absence and through the kind of the use of language uh, in this very strange time. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Lucia and Stephen to kind of introduce themselves and introduce what they do. And I'm also going to ask them to kind of introduce in the context of this conversation, what they understand community, communities to mean in relation to what they want to talk about to their own work. Uh, and starting with Lucia to the newspaper that you edit uh, and run for uh, your local community. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, so community in the context of Tottenham Community Press, I would say is shared spaces and shared experiences. Now Tottenham is made up of nine wards and it's seeing what people are doing within those wards, how they are managing, what resources they have access to or maybe not have access to now that we are experiencing such a shift in everyday life. And it's recording that um, just as it's happening. So via um, people's stories and um, yeah, very much kind of getting them to speak on what's happening. And, um, excuse my nerves. <laughs> um, speak on what's happening from their experiences and how they are working together and very much about resilience. And um, yeah, sorry, I'll get into this <laughs> as time goes on. That's great. Did, did you want to kind of show, share some examples of the newspaper and kind of show us a bit about, um, show some of the coverage of, of the local community? Yeah, definitely. So I'm just going to um, um, share my screen and tell you a bit about the paper and what we do. So you should, should see this now. Can you all see that? Yep. So this is our newspaper, Tottenham Community Press. This is the current front page. And as you can see, it is a quite um, an important story. As you know, the, the cladding scandal has hit a lot of people and particularly people in Hale Village, which is a part of 
Tottenham, Tottenham Hale, where there were many buildings affected. So it's speaking to those leaseholders, finding out how they are managing, especially in a time of COVID when resources are scarce, people have lost their jobs and they have to think about um, skyrocketing insurance payments. Is they know that their um, their homes are unsafe, potentially, you know, at risk of fire. So all of those things. A bit about us. We are free publication. We uh, the paper is co-produced. So in that sense, um, it would be me telling the news stories and the community contributing their stories. So whether that would be about their campaigns, their initiatives, or what they are doing in terms of um, maybe it could be lobbying the council for something that's really important to them or with the the scandal, the, the cladding, you know, what's our MP David Lamy doing about it? What has he got to say? And what's the government going to do about it? So it's telling those stories. We're independent and we're a social enterprise. So all money goes back into the paper. We started in 2016. We are the second title of what will be five titles coming mid of middle of this month. We're going to start a new publication based in Barnet. Um, we, we felt when we first launched that there wasn't a paper covering Tottenham. And a lot of a lot of previous mainstream coverage of Tottenham, some might say has been quite negative or um, doesn't necessarily reflect the community voices from you know the the average person living day to day day-to-day -day life in Tottenham. So we wanted to change that um, to make sure people had control of their own narratives. And we were a new platform, so it's quite exciting to kind of launch, get people excited about it, get them engaged so that they can contribute and feel that their stories would be, um, would be kind of dealt with with respect and care and tact. Okay, so in terms of um, Stephen's subject in community, COVID and community, I would like to discuss a few areas. So there'd be community, people, local economy and place and how COVID has personally affected us as an organisation. So this on the left, well this here, is um, that was our first, that was our first title that back in um, April last year which was this response to coronavirus. And that was very kind of quick. We have to find out what people are doing, how, um, how they're mobilizing. Um, and yeah, so I actually asked Stephen if he can go to a local cafe and he did, but to two sisters who had, um, I think they've just been open for a few months. I'm not too sure, but um, yeah, they were being challenged. <laughs> in terms of having to change their model and take away um, system via bike. So um, it was good to hear those stories and how people um, were coming together to kind of problem solve. So here are a couple of our community stories I'd like to share with you. So this story you can see it's a motorbike. I'm um, afraid you can't see the person on the motorbike, but they're a team um, of volunteers, they're a motorcycle group, and they are there to really, really help out. They um, they were really, really pivotal in delivering oxy oximeters from um, Royal Free Hospital to people who needed to kind of test their oxygen levels and things like that. This centre picture. Um, they didn't fare too well from COVID because their community centre ended up closing. So you kind of, with our paper, we kind of hear the ups and downs, the positive stories, the negative stories, how people have been impacted and what that means. And um, they were trying to fundraise and it didn't quite happen. So this picture, the this is a food bank. Um, and this team of people have really mobilized and created a network of food banks and throughout the borough of Haringey to make sure people who are experiencing food poverty and um, lack of um, 
who were just um, food insecurity, making sure that everything was covered. So throughout the week, they had meals. So it's been really, really good to kind of get those stories to see how people are kind of galvanizing and making sure that people are cared for because we've never experienced anything like this. So that networking and on the ground grassroots, let's help each other. It's been very, very prevalent in Tottenham. So that's a bit of our community coverage. People. So another food bank story. Um, the demand for Tottenham Food Bank has, has risen 300% since March last year, which is quite a scary, a scary thought really. A lot of people are dependent on food resources losing their jobs low pay just things are not like they used to be because i previous the previous year you can just see the stories completely changing so um it's been good to kind of document that and stephen has been volunteering he might want to share a bit more at some point later on um education lots of people studying from home now how is that affecting young people do they feel that their education has been in decline since so it's good to speak to local children and local teenagers about what remote learning is like for them now um how they feel this is going to impact their future and in what ways have their career goals changed so all of these questions um we want you to put out to the local community via our schools and our colleges and this story over here, this was from a family who are, they were struggling. They have a, a child who has severe disabilities and they just felt very, very isolated and unable to kind of cope with the changes and the lack of resources and the support they would have got from their son's school and having to work full-time jobs at home plus deal with the care of their son and education at home. So to have those stories, such personal um, personal insights at a time when they were so vulnerable, you just have to kind of really respect and handle it with care. So that gives you a snapshot of individual people and how COVID has um, affected them. Local economies. So I was just going to say that's that's great, Lucia. That gives us a very clear sense of um, the way in which the community has been affected in terms of services which are a part of maintaining the life of people in a community have been disrupted. And also the way in which the newspaper is kind of providing information about how those services are being um, maintained or or provided by alternative forms uh, but then also as you you bring out kind of the the way in which individuals within the community or families within the community are being affected and kind of bringing those um cases and situations to the notice of other people who may be able to help um which i think gives a really kind of good context of, of kind of your role as an editor in your newspaper's relationship to the community at the moment. Um, sorry, I, I interrupt you. I didn't know, do you want to kind of just wrap up with your last kind of couple of points and then I'll, I'll hand over to Steve to kind of talk about his own yeah, experience yeah. and understanding in relation to, to kind of these ideas. Yeah, um, the local economy was, is an example of three different cafes, one of which has just started up um, a takeaway. Um, yeah, a takeaway cafe to kind of um, sorry I'm gonna start again who started up a business this one has um the one in the middle their business had been struggling is finding alternative ways to make sure that they can sustain themselves and then people fundraising to make sure they can stay afloat so um as you say people are experiencing survival mode in terms of their businesses and their healthcare and things like that. So the paper has been a really great way of kind of curating those stories and letting people speak for themselves. So they contact me and then I kind of tease it out of them or the paper, the story is already formed 
and it's just kind of you know like what is your experience and what do you want to say and just packaging that in a way that is um easily digested by our readership so i think that was one, one more slide this is place um so people visually what have you seen what changes have you seen i quite like to have a photography segment in the paper so this is a photographer um, who has um, contributed to the latest edition and you know lockdown of um well the wrapping up of gym equipment and wearing masks on your daily walk to the park and just being socially isolated and you know speaking to each other through windows so um the paper is pretty much a collection of written stories and photographs and this is Tottenham. That's it really. So yeah, and how we've been affected as an organization, remote working, I haven't seen my colleagues in almost a year. <laughs> so um, obviously, virtually, yes, I have. Face-to-face has been completely different. We've changed our distribution model. So whereas we used to um, have lots of papers go through, um, delivered to cafes and community centers and things like that we're going door to door now so we've just had to adapt and people within Tottenham have to well have done the same also and that's it really for me and Stephen would you want to in terms of place because you document Tottenham you contribute to our paper every month pretty much how have you found have, how have you found it visually and as a resident yeah, Stephen, over, over well, to you. <laughs> over to me. Did, did I, you I, I have control of the screen. I have control of the screen. Uh, for me, I think it's been a very interesting experience. Uh, for me, community is what happens around me. Um, as far as uh, documentary photography and local news journalism, I'm really reporting on what I see and to a certain extent, I guess imposing my own interpretation on the events that I see around the events that I see around me. I mean, my my approach is uh, to hear about things, discuss them, and then maybe go out and photograph them. And I may also just be going out and photographing parts of the area because I'm interested in it visually because I think it has an interesting look to it. I think it expresses something about the area. I mean, one set of photographs that this year very kindly uh, 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 published was a set of pictures of trees in bloom. Uh, I mean, people so often talk about Tottenham as if it's this sort of urban wasteland populated by hoodies searching for, for their latest fix or postcode gangs fighting over things. But it is in fact very rural, its history is that of a rural village. Uh, it's only been part of London since the, uh, since the 1960s. Before then it was uh, rural Middlesex. My grandparents moved here because they, they wanted a better quality of life than uh, living in an urban area like Hubbow or Hoxton. And they came out to rural Tottenham. Uh, my parents used to talk about going to the farm at the end of the road and walking past the haystacks. And the uh, rah, rah, and the sheep and the other animals. I mean, for them, Broadwater Farm was where you went and got your milk. Uh, this this kind of element, the rural element, often gets lost. So it was it was quite nice when Lucia put in a series of photographs of trees in bloom, and quite a lot of the the, the photography I do is aimed at kind of trying to break down the uh, stereotypes uh, that I see around me. But that doesn't mean to say that there aren't, there aren't problems. I mean, it, as an area, it has always welcomed people looking to uh, gain employment or to improve their quality of life. The history of Tottenham for the last 100 years has been one of constant change of industrialization and then post-industrialization um, and of being a rural farming district. We do have some tensions in the area. They haven't, they haven't gone away. Um, I think if we look at uh, last month's issue, there was a very nice photograph on the front there, but uh, it was sadly a photograph of a, of a protest uh, over the behavior of some of the local police who were accused of punching uh, teenagers in the face when they had turned up to 
get their uh, um, GCSE results at school. Sorry, so do, do you want to talk a bit about the kind of your... I'm just about to talk about my project. <laughs> Fantastic, okay. <laughs> okay, so for those of you who aren't aware <laughs> and haven't had a chance to look at the showcase, my project uh, for uh, 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 my uh, MA at, uh, uh, at UAL, and I would encourage anybody who is interested in photography to seriously consider either an undergraduate or postgraduate course there, or uh, a, a diploma course there. They do have some very good facilities and some very knowledgeable people. Uh, this is the book that I produced, the photo book. I'll just bring it back as a result of my uh, uh, studies. Uh, you can see here, it's about the experience of being 68 with high blood pressure and type two diabetes and the experience of living through lockdown and COVID. It's very, very much an eccentric view of the, when, and when I say eccentric, I don't mean kind of like uh, wacko, I mean, unique to myself. Uh, built around uh, my photography in the area and my discussions with people that I see or know. My own experience hasn't been the sort of trauma that we see in the mainstream press. And there is quite a difference, I think, between what the mainstream press talks about and what we see happening at a local level. For me, for me, the experience has been, of the people I know, the experience has been one of a chilling of social opportunity of a depletion in the kinds of resources that we expect to have access to, to maintain our quality of life and uh, our social experience. Where in the past, we would have been able to go to uh, um, join in large meetings, talks, uh, discuss issues that are of concern to us. This, is, this has all disappeared. We, we, it's very difficult now to join in in exercise or, or art groups. These have gone online, but going online and having a telephone conversation with your doctor isn't, isn't really quite the same as being there face to face and having an opportunity to go face to face. I mean, cultural, cultural symbols uh, um, such as the, you know, and, and these are very important cultural symbols, I think, if you're talking to older people, uh, things like the ceremony, uh, the remembrance ceremony, uh, Tottenham is all, always very well attended, both at the High Cross, uh, where the Cenotaph is, or in Tottenham Cemetery. Again, usually this is quite a large event, lots of people turn up, and there are a lot of social opportunities there. This has been kind of, this, these kinds of activities have been lost. The ability to engage in a community and to be part of a community for older people has to a certain extent been lost. And this will have, uh, I believe, long-term effects because um, it's these activities that I think divert people away from residential care. Mm -hmm. If they have a, uh, people have high self-esteem, if people are engaged with the communities around them, if they're engaged with the people around them, uh, then they will look after themselves. They will uh, um, have access to things that stimulate their mind and stimulate them physically. Lose those and they're stuck at home, they're eating badly, they're not uh, engaging in things that activate, that keep their mind active. And they will, I think, begin to mentally and physically deteriorate. And we will see uh, eventually a greater need for, for residential care as a result of the loss of these kinds of, um, these kinds of services. Also, interestingly, in trying to, from a photographic perspective, in trying to represent the um, experience of uh, COVID, I have tended to move towards, uh, alter, for those of you who are interested in, in these kinds of things, uh, what are known as alternative photographic technology techniques. Uh, when I first started at uh, UAL, I was very, very much a digital man. I'd thrown away all my analog stuff a long time ago. I really liked getting out there and worrying about the image resolution and uh, uh, what the lighting was doing. But uh, you know, I've tended to steer away from that to what's known as alternative alternative techniques and using things like pinhole cameras really cheap cameras rather than these hugely expensive digital ones. I mean, a lot of the imagery in my study I took 
using uh, soup tins with bits of uh, uh, paper in the back, uh, paper negative, well, no, it's paper negatives, and I was developing them using coffee and uh, washing up liquid, uh, washing, uh, sorry, washing soda. Uh, I've also started using uh, cyanotypes, which is a, a type of uh, printing process that was developed in the 1840s um, to try and capture the kind of strangeness and the unusualness of um, the experience uh, uh, of going through this, this, this period of time. And I think these kinds of alternative techniques do tend to capture these kinds of issues. Also, I think it's great to have a different way of talking about Tottenham and looking at Tottenham. And I think is again, one of the advantages of the UAL course is that it does give you a vocabulary with which to talk about photography and to talk about what you're doing with your, your images and to develop your own perhaps visual voice uh, for expressing what you're wanting to say. As Lucia mentioned earlier, there has been and continues to be a big problem with the way the life in this area is characterized. It's very much dominated by some riots that happened uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago and uh, 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 images of, of crime and violence, which is not how people experience it on a day-to-day -day basis and doesn't really reflect the experience of living here, of being part of the, of the community here. The community is very strong. And okay. as Lucia said, sorry, Ed, I'm stamping over you. Say no, what you're gonna say, Ed. No, I was just gonna say, well, you've both given us um, a kind of a, a really good impression of how you feel kind of COVID has interrupted and affected kind of the normal services uh, that a community needs uh, and that people who are vulnerable in the community need. Um, and also kind of highlighted kind of the role that the newspaper has played and Stephen, your own work has played in trying to kind of highlight what those um, interruptions and effects have been. I just wonder if you kind of looking forwards um in terms of the the theme of of communities and covid kind of what we feel may come out of um the pandemic i mean as the vaccine program starts to roll out um as hopefully we get a chance to um move around and see other people again I wonder if um, Lucia, first of all, if you you see or if you think you could describe any sort of permanent changes, either for the good or possibly and sadly, which may be detrimental, kind of um, looking ahead. Hmm, looking ahead, I think um, Tottenham has been hard hit in terms of financially. Um, it has always been quite a deprived area. Um, so I think we will get some funding out of this, um, which has kind of been coming in through um, our streets, so widening pavement, for example, to make sure that social distance in Chapman is, um, is easier. So I think that will kind of come into, come into play. Um, I think people are going to be much more appreciative of the area in different ways in terms of um we've just had so much more of a neighborly feel people helping each other out with you know um cooking meals and things like that so at the end of it i can only hope you just come out stronger i would like to think there's a, there's a good question from uh, Max Horton uh, in the chat box. So kind of on this idea of looking ahead, um, she asked, do you think the pandemic, well, she says she's, what you're doing is fantastic uh, as, as a, a local newspaper. I think we'd all agree with that. But she asked, do you think the pandemic might eventually reorder attitudes towards social justice, um, i.e. the fact that people in Tottenham live in fear of either fire or bills they can't afford and can't afford enough food? things that shouldn't be happening in one of the richest cities of the world. Uh, and while what you're doing is an enormous work of care, is any part of your job pointed towards campaigning uh, for change? And, and we were discussing uh, before we came on air about kind of what the role of a local newspaper is at a time of crisis. Um, we kind of talked about ideas of support, reassurance, information, but also kind of the idea of, of lobbying and campaigning. So I wonder if you kind of see 
the what's happening at the moment as an opportunity to kind of lobby and try and campaign for some of the changes some of the to, to affect social justice as, as max asks um i'm just being in the process of writing a response to max um, okay. which i have i'm gonna well anyway oh, yeah. so, <laughs> um it hasn't gone through at all um i don't think i can see a, a, a response which has gone to all panelists but okay. um yeah. okay. why don't you, why don't you talk us through it yeah um, I think people's attitudes have changed because they've had to. I think people are much more in a fragile state, as um, I've said about the, the the food resources and things like that. So um, it is a sense of fear if you're if you're struggling with not knowing where your food's coming from, or you you used to have a job, and it's just a massive shock to the system and a change. So um, people have definitely been vocal about it. And I think, um, yeah, and they've been letting the council know this is what we need. And people have been stepping in ahead of time, you know, before the government or before the council kind of, you know, just saying, look, we know our local area, we know the person who lives down the road and we can do this. So just pulling together and mobilizing in that sense. Um, and I think, just going to read over the question again so I make sure. Um, and yeah, we ask people to, um, for our comments page, for example, we don't want people to be kind of shy about what they need. At this time, I don't think you can be really. Um, it's whether you want to share that, but if you know that certain people have the answers, ask those questions. And if you don't feel you can ask those questions, then I will, you know, ask me and I'll ask a counselor, I'll ask um, our MP and things like that. So, um, but I, I do think people are kind of feeling that they um, are gonna talk about what they need. So I, I do think, yes, people might be living in fear, for example, with their housing, but they are, they're talking about it because people are saying to me, this is what's happening and this is how you should change it. And um, campaigning, does David Lammy help? He was quite vocal on the Cladding story, which is our front page. And he has been generally since Grenfell nationwide. So for his constituents, he has been talking up about it. Um, his work on a case-to-case -case basis, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers that question. That's great, thank you very much. And so Stephen, I mean, do you feel that um, the crisis which is hitting communities as a result of the pandemic will encourage people to raise their voices and to campaign more at locally and also perhaps a national level. And moving on from that, as, as a local photographer who makes images for the local newspaper, are there any particular kind of issues that you see yourself making work about in the future? Well, I think there's a, a lot more knowledge going to be shared in the future about what the community is and who is active within the community. As a result of the uh, voluntary uh, step forward by large numbers of people in the area uh, doing things like food banks, I mean, I volunteered initially for the uh, as an NHS responder, that that was so popular that I never got anything to do. <laughs> so I went and uh, uh, went and joined, got in contact with the local food bank, said, hey, do you need people to take take stuff around and you know there was there's me and um, unfortunately because of the second wave I've decided to step back a bit from doing food bank deliveries for a while until, until, until it's a bit under a bit more a bit more under control and the COVID levels are a bit lower uh, um, but uh, uh, there was me and, and kind of like lo uh, loads of other people turning up saying let's you know let's do this and you know we're carting using our cars to drive out into the community to people to, to, to places around the community we wouldn't usually go to uh, uh, to give people uh, um, food that they uh, that they need for their physical survival 
this uh, uh, there's also a number of community kitchens started up uh, and, and a lot of other community activities going on around the area uh, as a result of covid and i think the people engaging with these activities will come to know more about uh, their their own community they will come to know more about what the problems are of their own community things will not be quite so much hidden behind uh, 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 front doors uh, because people will have gone in they will have spoken to they will have spoken to uh, 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 guys on guys on the street I mean why they, they will be asking questions why at a time when uh, um, uh, homeless people are supposed to be being housed. Are, am I seeing people sitting out on the street or sleeping on the street? It shouldn't be happening. They will ask their local councillors about that, and they do ask their local councillors about it, and their local councillors are doing doing stuff about it. A particular issue that uh, I've been wondering about is how uh, unwaged, sorry, not unwaged, how homeless and undocumented people are going to gain access to the vaccine, because I can't see any route in the prioritization scheme that uh, 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 that's been published to provide a way for somebody who is undocumented uh, to gain access to a, to a vaccine and as such they are at risk not only of uh, uh, dying from covid but also of of spreading covid uh, same for people who are, who are homeless it's possible that when people are being housed, they're also being signed up to a GP and they will get it through that route. But that's not really being made clear uh, uh, at a national level. So there are some local initiatives. So I think those kinds of issues will need to be followed up and you know, somebody will have to hold the uh, uh, institutions or the government institutions, local and national government institutions that are responsible for these kinds of activities, because things can only happen at a local level if the national level makes provision for it. It's been interesting to feel how um, there seems to be a contrast at a national level anyway, between the effectiveness of test and trace, which was predominantly put out to the private sector to run and now the vaccine program which does seem to be working starting to to have effect and to be reaching people even if it is taking longer to get to certain areas yeah that seems to be taking place through predominantly kind of the NHS structures and the local organizations are kind of at that kind of level there seems to be sort of a focus on the fact that sort of smaller community networks do seem to be effective in these kind of situations. So it's kind of interesting that you both feel that, that coming out of this, there will be greater awareness of local issues, local community networks. I mean, I, my own uh, aunt who lives in a small village, I think it's, it's been remarkable to, to see the way in which local networks have come together through food banks and other forms of just helping out individuals who are isolated. Uh, and I think, there's a comment from Nick Madge, I think Lucia, you reflect on that as well, this kind of relationship between the idea of community spirit and local politics um, coming to the fore through people's awareness of the, the need to have uh, a local response to issues of social justice and to take over where kind of national policies don't work. Um, but then kind of the issue of, of how there may be a longer term impact for those people who are isolated uh, kind of the idea of social isolation may itself have issues which will affect individuals in the longer term. I, I don't know if either of you want to respond to that kind of relationship between the individual and the community and those longer term impacts. Well, I think there's been a, a huge increase in the use of social media for to provide contact groups. Certainly in the area I'm in, there are now a number of WhatsApp groups uh, that take responsibility at a, at a street level and um, people mm -hmm. will, will stay in contact at street level and also at a ward level uh, um, you know say like Bruce Grove Ward has a has its own uh, contact group mm -hmm. but I think you make a good point where you talk about difference uh, 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 between national initiatives and local initiatives I think the issue is the same as it's always been that people at a local level know the detail of the area that they're in 
and they can mesh into the detail. If that knowledge of the detail isn't present in the national program, like you've just got a bunch of guys in a call centre somewhere up north, uh, I mean, they're, uh, and they're trying to deal with people who are living in uh, uh, housing estates in and around the London area, there's, there's going to be a culture clash. They aren't really going to understand uh, uh, what, what needs to be done. They aren't really, the guys making the phone calls aren't really going to know the area or know what they're dealing with when they're, when they're talking to people at the other end of the line and they will get a negative reaction. Mm. Lucia? Yeah, I think as, yeah, Stephen has said, people in the area, they have a sense of ownership of their local space and place and the people who they would have, you know, mingled with in the local cafe. So they are keeping an eye on people who they, they're not seeing. And, um, and it is kind of, I think people have been more politically emboldened on a local level to kind of um, see where things can be better. And they're not kind of um, scared to say, you know, like we need resources here and we need them now. Or what can we do to fill the gap in between and asking the right questions. So I think um, the paper has been a great way to kind of put those voices on display. Um, in terms of social, social isolation, sorry. Um, yeah, I really do see that we're just gonna have to keep an eye on that because we're in a position which we've not experienced before and loneliness and it all kind of plays into fears and if you haven't got people to speak to. So um, yeah, the longer term effects of that, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but in the day to day, I think people are doing what they can and seeking help where they know to seek it. I would like to think so. The people who I engage in with on a day to day basis have kind of um, kind of been thankful for the resources or the, the helplines that you put in the paper, you know, the befriending services and things like that. Um, so, yeah. Mm. I was a, well, I should say to any anyone who's got a question, please do. Uh, put something in the, the Q&A box or in the chat box as well. So please do feel free to, to contribute and to, to ask questions of Lucia and Stephen as well. I just wondered, Lucia, as a, a local newspaper editor, whether there's been any kind of reaching out to you from central government to kind of use um, the, the networks which you have created um, as a local newspaper, as, as a kind of a conduit, a, a, a way in which they can communicate at a local level? Yeah, in terms of um, advertising, they can do so. Mm. Yeah, so if they wanted to put like a, a public health message, you know, we have space for advertising. Um, in terms of um, editorial content, we don't blur the lines in terms of we don't want people to, we, we are an independent newspaper. So it won't be kind of like party political, you know, we're, they're trying to get a sort of certain story. Um, if they are, so yeah, that's where I'm kind of strict in that sense. Um, but yeah, the paper, we have been making links um, nationally and, you know, yeah. To kind of we had um, David Lammy um, put an article, a newspaper. Sorry, it was like a sponsored content piece in the paper. It was very clearly sponsored con content, and he spoke to his constituents. You know, at a time we needed him to speak. Yeah. So, and then you know, so I kind of asked him, "Can you do that, please?" Because people are kind of fearful; they don't know what's happening. So it was quite nice to kind of have that. And the same as I'll do ask the local council and head of the council and seeing what initiatives they, they've got planned. So in terms of, you know, if they wanted to have a sponsored content and it clearly says, you know, message from um, your MP, we will have that space carved out. So mm. yeah, they can feel free to get in touch. And if they want to reach our readership, could we have like a, we have a run of 10,000 10, copies each month. So we cover a wide space. So I'm always easy to get in contact with. Mm, mm. Fascinating. Um, Stephen, um, from your own personal perspective of, you know, someone who, who is potentially vulnerable, um, 
how, I mean, your own kind of relationship to the kind of the networks, the services which you have helped support and which maybe you've used, how, how do you see your own kind of personal situation evolving as uh, the pandemic hopefully starts to lessen? Well, as it goes down, then I guess it's going to be back to business as normal. But probably what I'll take away from it is a greater knowledge and of the local community. Uh, a lot of additional contacts in the community that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And, uh, uh, um, and also, uh, uh, I, I guess, other people will tend to know about what, who I am and may recognise my face as... Uh, 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 when they see me out with a camera because you always there's always the issue that uh, sometimes while well, i enjoy taking photographs and don't worry about people taking photographs uh some people don't like uh having their photograph taken so i think it's always wise to to be polite and to to get try and get people's permission before you start start clicking away in front of them i hope it, it would lead to a sort of better reception uh, to seeing me hanging around the place uh, uh, taking photographs. I, ha I have to say, I, I'm, I have some concerns about the, the vaccine rollout at the moment, particularly the, uh, um, the, the problems about vaccine production and the, um, what seems to be a sort of somewhat xenophobic and nationalistic stance that's, that's being taken towards the, the UK's retention of the orders that it's made for for vaccines and i think this will tend to play may play itself out as a as a vaccine vaccine hesitancy i mean some people will not want the idea that uh, elderly and vulnerable people in france and germany are going to be possibly dying uh, so they can get their vaccine early and not have to wear a mask when they go down the pub yeah. Uh, I think there are folk who would say, well, OK, I'll wait an extra couple of weeks and uh, uh, or an extra month or so and, and not worry about it. Let somebody in Germany who's who's over 80 or somebody in France or Italy who's uh, over 70 have that jab. I'll wait around yeah. for a while. That it, the, that the issue of vaccine hesitancy is is really important. And I wonder, Lucia, kind of, whether um, that's something, a subject that the local, your local paper can help with in terms of um, spreading information or countering misinformation about the importance and the, the benefits and countering issues, ideas of kind of the harm that may come from the vaccine. That's at one level. I also kind of, so I'm really running out of time a bit, what can I say that to another, question beyond that for you as well, which is the, the community of local newspapers is to what extent you are, what that community is like, kind of the, your communication with other local newspaper editors and kind of whether you see yourselves as a group, as a community having a kind of uh, a coherent role at, uh, at this time of crisis. Um, TCP is a member of the um, ICCN. So it is the community of network of local papers. Could be a very hyper local so it's, it's quite nice to kind of have um a bunch of editors who know exactly what you're going through and can tell you about their demographics and their local community so we are part of the network who are kind of lobbying from our perspective to get advertising in the paper from the government or to kind of have the as i said these kind of health adverts from the local hospital or from um, Public Health England in our papers so that we're not left out of the media landscape in that sense. So not all of it's going through the, the national press and because um, a lot of people do look to our paper before the mainstream uh, media and um, we've got really close interaction with our audiences, mm -hmm. whether that be via like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, people are constantly directly emailing me and I take the time to kind of email them back. So we're always having this ongoing conversation about our local space. So um, you just won't get that with a national newspaper who knows Tottenham as much as, um, yeah, say for example, me and my team who are on the ground here trying to report on all kinds of stories, um, COVID related, 
and outside of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. There's a, um, a specific kind of related idea of vaccine hesitancy. Another comment from Max about the reports of, of um, people of colour being resistant to it, uh, but at the same time having been one of the sort of the community groups most affected by uh, the pandemic. And she asked, do you see a role for promoting the vaccine or do you feel that would compromise your independence? Well, I think you've just, you've just answered that as kind of... You, I would always want to get the facts out there yeah. and people, um, people kind of make sense of it, mm. you know, kind of, you know, this is what um, the doctor says from your local hospital. This is what the local CCG are saying. Um, so getting those voices there and let people kind of um, determine what's, what what works you know um but speaking to the right people who know what they're doing so yeah has there been um have the local public been kind of using the paper as a forum for debating these issues around vaccine hesitancy or kind of likely take up of the opportunity to be vaccinated no not really not as yet um, I know that there are other forums within the um, within the borough, and I'm sure these conversations are being had there because I don't really have a forum. We don't our paper doesn't really have a forum like a discussion forum. Mm. But people can always feel free to say this is what I'm thinking, and then I can kind of ask on their behalf, which I usually do, and trying to seek to get those answers. Mm. Um, but yeah, I do know people are having these conversations elsewhere, and there I would kind of take the time to speak to the right people mm -hmm. and say, you know, this is what is happening, or this is what they're dealing with, and this is what they know, just to have the expert knowledge to kind of give some reassurance, because mm -hmm. um, I can understand all kinds of fears and things like that uncertain because everything's uncertain now you really I can understand how people might not take things on face value and then it's a whole lot of things that you have to kind of have to consider so um we just want to kind of relay kind of give them the professional insight and let them make that come to their own understanding I guess mm. yeah but yeah there is space in the paper to kind of have these discussions yeah. Fantastic. Okay, uh, last five minutes. Uh, I think we're going to wrap up at, at, at six. Maybe you'd both like to just, ha if you have any final comments, uh, kind of based on kind of the reflections we've heard and the comments you've both made about community and COVID. Um, Stephen, do you have any kind of last thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, I would say that I think local news and uh, local phot photojournalism has an important role to play in helping communities to have a dialogue about themselves and express themselves uh, in ways that they control uh, rather than have images of what they are, who they are imposed on them. I often get concerned that there are the negative images that, that, that are imposed onto uh, Tottenham as an area, uh, um, cause low self-esteem amongst the young people here and cause them to have low self-respect and then as a consequence, engage in uh, uh, um, difficult behaviour that brings them into conflict with uh, 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 with law enforcement and other uh, other arms of uh, uh, local and national government. Mm. Oh, thank you. Interesting. Yes, Lucia. Any last thoughts? Um, I think it's going to be more of the same in the sense of people kind of mobilising, seeing what the need is and making sure they meet it in whatever way, pooling of resources, whether that be money or time. And um, more questions, you know, um, more questions asked because there are going to be more uncertainties ahead. So um, I think that's going to be more of the same for, yeah, the immediate time to come um yeah i think the vaccine um once the rollout is complete and um there's going to be more reporting on that from tcp and generally um nationally 
um, I think that might change attitudes again. Mm. So um, yeah, I think it's going to be a constant shifting of shifting up attitudes according to the knowledge we acquire as we go along. So it, it is kind of like step by step. You kind of have an understanding and then something else comes up and you ask more questions. And so it's going to be like that, I, I think. Mm, mm. Okay, well, thank you both very much for a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you both for the work that you've done in this area. I know Stephen, your project has done quite a bit of it, is kind of looking at how local community groups have been trying to replace the services which have been disrupted by um, COVID with other forms of, of kind of networking and communication with also online fitness classes and everything. Uh, which is, you know, you, you've documented a really important part of what communities or your local community is trying to do. And Lucia, your, your newspaper is obviously playing a, a vital part in kind of both informing, supporting and lobbying on for and on behalf of the community. And yeah, at, I mean, just in conclusion, I, I, I do get a sense that um, as you've both pointed out, kind of that idea of community spirit is sort of a, a cliche way of saying it, of, of local action, of desire for change, of understanding the importance of the support networks provided, uh, not only by key workers who have been dreadfully undervalued, but also the importance of the communication you have with your local community to provide help for people who are vulnerable, um, and to provide support for each other. I, I think that is something which I hope will come out of this and have uh, a profound and long lasting uh, effect on our local and national politics. So thank you both very much indeed for helping set up um, this really interesting conversation. And I should also say, as lastly to the audience that there are more talks coming up, more events coming up as part of the uh, LCC postgraduate showcase. There was a, there is a link in, um, I think there's a link in the chat box early on. Yet yeah, there is. Uh, if you scroll up through the chat box, you can click on that link, which takes you to the graduate showcase where you can see all the work and find out details of more of the events, which will be coming up tomorrow and in the next few days. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you again to Lucia and Stephen. Uh, congratulations to Stephen on his, his project and for completing the, the MA. Um, and yeah, I look forward to seeing some of you in some of the, the talks coming up in the next few days. Can I just thank you for uh, taking the trouble to moderate us and sparing the time to moderate the conversation, Ed. And thank you, Lucia. Uh, for very kindly agreeing to uh, to come along and take part in the conversation and also to thank the audience for turning up and asking us some interesting and useful questions. I hope you found it interesting. I certainly found it interesting and I look forward to continuing the dialogue in the future. Thank, thank you. you.